The sea was the beginning. And for thousands of years, man has met her challenges and reaped her bounties to sustain his own life. She has been a source of fun and pleasure, hardship and fear. And all too often, she has reclaimed some of those she spawned. She has filled his mind with awe and curiosity. From the beginning, man has sought ways to return to her depths and unravel her mysteries. His progress hampered only by his own deficiencies. Until at last, technology has allowed him to re-enter the water world and to gaze at beauty like that of a poet's dream. To the diver, it is little wonder that once you have floated among this fairy world, there is always the urge to return. So vast and beautiful are her colors, forms and textures. So varied and strange her varieties of life. So unpredictable her temperatures and her moody currents. At every turn there is something new to capture the imagination. A picture to be remembered long after the moment. Nature has lavished her talents on the sea. As in all her creation, there is life and death. But in her wisdom, she has learned to create life and beauty out of death and horror. The sea is many things to many people. But to the scuba diver, she is a constant source of adventure. And few places in the world can equal the beauty and excitement of a safari to Truck Lagoon. For here is the most unusual museum on earth, an undersea graveyard of over a hundred ships of the Japanese Imperial Navy's Fourth Fleet. Approximately 13,000 miles from New York, the Truck Islands sit peacefully among the Carolina Islands of the West Pacific. Our safari of 17 landed on the island of Moen, largest of the group and the only one to support both a hotel and a church. These tropic atolls are blessed with over 400 inches of rain a year, which accounts for the perpetual puddles in the road in a constantly changing sky. We were all getting anxious by the time we reached our boat, the Trimaran. It became no small matter getting everything on board. Besides our regular diving gear, many of us also carried underwater lights and cameras. Fortunately, below deck offered plenty of space. Here we could load the cameras and store the film, protected from the ocean sprays. On other occasions, this has proven no easy feat. Like any sport, diving has its elements of risk so naturally, everyone is very particular about their equipment. This really isn't the mass of confusion it looks. At last, we reached the Fujikawa Maru with her protruding mast, preparing for our first dive. I began to wonder what we might find. It's hard to picture this peaceful lagoon filled with Japanese ships, the sky covered with planes raining down bombs and torpedoes, ships exploding, burning and sinking. But in 1944, it was almost a regular occurrence. They have waited for 28 years, undisturbed. Everything just as it was. A trip 
back into history. Looking down after the bubbles cleared, the sight was unbelievable. A hundred feet below lay the huge hulk of the Fujikawa. As we descended, we saw the lovely soft coral covering her decks. The whole ship had become one beautiful artificial reef. The conditions in the lagoon were perfect. The water was a comfortable 85 degrees with practically no current, allowing for visibility sometimes over 100 feet. This is due to a barrier reef that protects the 40-mile lagoon from the turbulence of the restless Pacific Ocean. For the diver, truck is truly unique. For beauty, there is marine life and soft coral to explore and photograph. For adventure, the wrecks untouched, eerie, and possibly deadly. As we entered the hull, we discovered how deadly. Everywhere beneath a layer of silt were boxes of live ammunition. Suddenly I felt as if I'd slipped back in time. In one hole we came across a truck. All the parts still movable. Without the corroding effects of air oxidation, everything was in excellent condition. and is apt to remain that way for another hundred years or more. This room was a mess of sake bottles. Sailors are all the same, regardless of what Navy. We continued our explorations. Among the deck guns on the Fujikawa, we found this one still had a canister of live ammunition under the barrel, ready to load. On the way to the bridge, there appeared a Henicus Acuminatus, whom we fondly refer to as Snoopy. Once convinced of our unimportance, she nonchalantly disappeared. The bridge was a garden of soft corals and small fishes whose home we were temporarily occupying. Practically concealed from view amidst the coral were the compass, wheel, binnacle box, and amazingly, the twin telegraphs. This is very rare, for wrecks are usually stripped almost as soon as they're discovered. Fortunately, it will never happen at Truck Lagoon, for this has now been designated an underwater historical monument by the U.S. and Truckee's governments. Nothing may be removed without their permission, and then only to go into the Truckee's museum. Snoopy decided to make sure we didn't do anything illegal. With slightly over two minutes of air left, we went back to retrieve one of the cameras and enjoy the beauty. With our air supply just about depleted, we ascended for new tanks and a dive on the Hien Maru. 
As we reached the Hian Maru, you could tell she was enormous, over 500 feet in length, laying on her port side. Swimming slowly along the hull of the ship, we found her name written in both English and in Japanese characters, leaving no doubt as to her identity. It took almost five minutes, with each of us trying a different area, to discover she was empty, except for a couple of small sharks and a ship's light laying on one of the holes. Like the other ships in this fairy land, she did contain an especially beautiful array of soft coral, various fishes, giant clams, scallops, mussels, sponges, staghorn coral, wire coral, and the most beautiful of all, the Gorgonian sea fans. Once the ship's light was brought on deck of the Hian, we proceeded to attach a lifting bag and prepared to take her to the surface to be placed in the museum. A lifting bag is much like a hot air balloon. You blow in your exhaust bubbles and she starts to lift. As it rises and the pressure lessens, if you don't tap the top of the bag, releasing some of the air, she'll pop up like a cork. These bags make it amazingly easy to take very heavy objects out of the water. At night, everything changes in the sea, much as it does on land. Many of the predators come out to feed. The schools of small fish have disappeared into shelter. Patterns and shapes that were lovely during the day are now strange and grotesque in the darkness. The ships feel eerie and haunted. Just about the time you really begin to feel spooked, who should show up but Snoopy, believe it or not, swimming upside down like a cave fish who always swim that way because they never see the light. So there's no difference between top and bottom. Snoopy, as usual, totally unconcerned. We left her in peace and continued on. At night, we usually wear a light wetsuit or an extra shirt for warmth. You lose body heat very rapidly in the water. Staying warm even when the sea temperature is 85 degrees is a problem. A shirt may not do much for a bikini, but you can't have everything. Early each morning, we again loaded the 35 air tanks aboard the trimaran, checked over our gear, and headed out into the lagoon. Today we are on our way to dive the submarine Shinohara, 150 feet down. Back in 1944, when she sank, she was one of eight giant subs, all over 300 feet in length, and larger than anything the Allies or Germans had at the time. Her range was 16,000 miles, and she had been at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, during that infamous attack. On April 4, 1944, the Allied B-24s paid their call on truck, or she was then moored, probably, for refitting. In the frenzy of diving to safety, a hatch was left open. Once the sub started her dive, there was no way to halt the water. The pressure was too great. The control room flooded, and many officers were lost. Some hatches were closed by the crew, leaving them sealed in their compartments. When she failed to resurface, a salvage tug was sent. A diver, tapping on the hull, communicated with the trapped men. They tried to resurface her, but she had taken more water than expected, and they were hampered constantly by the bombing raids. Everyone has seen enough World War II movies to imagine what it was like for the crew during those long hours. 